I want to talk a bit today about some research we've been doing over the last two, three years. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I am a pilot. I'm not a very good pilot. I've had one engine failure and two undercarriage hangups in about 300 and 40 hours of flying. So never, ever come flying with me. It's a very bad idea. Uh, but what's been quite interesting is seeing how recent changes have resulted in many, many more airplanes being retired. Uh, over the last few years, we've had the opportunity to carry out security research on Airbus A320s, Boeing 747s, desperately trying to get access to a 787 and a 350 for all sorts of reasons, because there's cool tech on there. Over the last couple of years, we've done quite a few talks, presented quite a bit of research at places like the DEF CON Aerospace Village. Uh, and we're also members of a group that Boeing put together, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, where they brought together security researchers who kind of understand and enabled independent research, which is really, really cool. Um, the first thing before I go anywhere with this is I want to talk about disclosure. It's really, really important. Frankly, the media seem to lose their shit if anyone talks about hacking planes. So we need to be super careful about not going and dropping O days on the traveling public. I fly. I fly as a passenger. I'm a pilot. Our friends, our families fly. So please, my personal advice is don't treat responsible disclosure in aviation the same way as you do in any other industry. Might seem unreasonable, but frankly, planes take a long time to fix. Primary reason being is they're certified. So they have been through hugely important safety testing regimes. And to modify that plane for any reason takes time. So don't expect to go and do a Google Project Zero and drop an O-Day on 90 days after initial disclosure. Uh, you can get to vendors. Uh, there are some great methods for getting um, airplane manufacturers and operators to listen. And there are some great routes that will open up channels to have a positive and constructive dialogue there too. Um, there have been a few cases, you've saw, I'm sure you've seen them in the media over recent years where disclosure hasn't gone so well, primarily through, I think, a lack of mutual understanding where the researchers didn't understand the industry and industry didn't understand the researchers. Uh, there's also great examples where the media's truly taken one, add one, and made it about three million. Um, there is segregation between the cabin systems and the flight control systems. So taking control of thrust management computers from the IFE, frankly, doesn't happen. I don't know where that story got to. I've spoken to the FBI investigator who looked at that. Um, we've got no idea. I think the media just got a bit excited. What's changed? Well, we have Corona. Um, uh, there are very few silver linings to the coronavirus, sadly. Uh, but one of those is that older, less inefficient airplanes are being retired at a faster rate than perhaps we might have originally expected. Good example being virtually the entire 747 passenger fleet has been laid up or converted into freighters. That is interesting because it provides opportunity for independent research. It's quite risky pen testing aviation systems. Uh, you run the risk of even running conventional test tools of causing damage or destroying certification so the plane could never fly again. But if the plane's been laid up and isn't going to fly again, you've got fun to be had. There are multiple boneyards around the UK and around the US. And if you talk to the right people, uh, sometimes an exchange of money helps as well. Uh, but by and large, the boneyards seem to be quite receptive. Uh, they're a great source of parts, some very expensive, some not so. But also, if you time it well and have a good relationship with the boneyard, you'll get access to a plane that's just flown in. It's never going to fly again, but they're so damn busy taking planes apart, it's not just lay them up for a bit. So you can, for example, pay for ground power. Now, we've done that successfully, or you can run the APU. It's incredibly expensive to do so. Uh, budget on a 747, you need either the APU running at about $400 to $500 worth of Jet A1, or two ground power units consuming about half of that. So research is often time bound because you go and want to pen test a plane and learn about it, then go away, learn more, come back, and you find the plane's been taken to pieces, which isn't great, quite frustrating, but uh, adds time pressure. As a result of that, we've had access to lots of fun things. Uh, so we've had access to the avionics bay, we've had access to line replaceable units, so stuff like these uh, and the flight management control systems. Uh, we've made, managed to buy secondhand devices, sometimes off eBay, sometimes from the boneyards, and also had access to the um, uh, the networks that you'll find on the plane. I'll talk about those in a moment. Getting hold of kit is hard. Even used uncertified kit, 20 years old, is expensive. 
The major problem is powering them because they run unusual power. Typically, we'll see 400 volts DC, maybe 20 amps AC sometimes. That's dangerous, so be really careful. Even getting the right power supplies can be expensive too. Uh, the protocols are custom, so typically on a 320, you'll find it using ARINC 429 on its flight control data buses. Um, interfacing with those isn't actually that difficult, so you can use something as simple as a picoscope will decode 429 for you. Uh, decoding isn't too much of a hassle, but injection is a real problem because you've got three concurrent buses that you have to send the same data on at least two of them concurrently. Not easy. As you move on to other um, protocols, so on the 777, you'll find using ARINC 629, which uh, is an inductively coupled bus. Uh, the decoder for that alone costs $30,000. We managed to borrow one for a while. But then you might move on to things like the 787, the 380, which use ARINC 664, which is fundamentally Ethernet, which is great because you're getting onto protocols that we know and understand every day of the week. Uh, getting hold of the kit can be hard, but if you persevere, you will get hold of it. Now, what can go wrong? Um, I'm often said, well, you can't hack planes, they don't work. Well, actually, weird things happen. And actually, hacking the plane itself isn't easy, but often going for the systems that feed information to the plane or control its availability can be more productive. So great example, so Ravenair, uh, they're an operator, I believe, in Alaska. Uh, they had an outage of their maintenance system. Um, it's probably ransomware by the looks of things. It wasn't actually disclosed, but because their maintenance system wasn't available and the backup had also been ransomed, they couldn't prove the serviceability of their airplanes. If you can't prove the plane is split to fly, you can't fly it. So Sadly, the, um, that particular airplane, uh, sorry, operator went bust shortly afterwards. Maybe that was a factor we don't know, but it's really interesting is that sometimes it's the unexpected systems that cause planes not to be able to fly. Another good example, this goes back to 2015. So American used an electronic flight bag, and we'll talk a lot more about those in a minute. The electronic flight bag is used to for all sorts of functions, but one particular one is charts. Now, a chart is basically the three-dimensional map that a pilot uses to work out how to approach and land at the, air, at the airport. So it'll describe how they're supposed to intercept the instrument landing system, the safety areas and routines. Now, there was an update carried out to the electronic flight bag application. I think it was a Jeppesen app, which is a very well-known provider of uh, aircraft charts. And a duplicate happened. I believe it was the chart, the approach chart to Washington Reagan airports. And because there was a discrepancy that two charts at the same airport were published the app at the same time, uh, all the EFBs that used that locked up. And it caused an outage which stopped uh, American dispatching any planes until that uh, was resolved. That caused nearly 2,000 flights to be delayed. And it makes you realize that if you don't have paper backups, you're going to be in real trouble. And no one carries paper charts anymore. Why would you? It's all on your EFB. Another example, this is really recent, this happened in the summer, so Southwest, they had a weather data feed. Now, aviation weather is different to the weather you pick up from the weather channel. Uh, it, it's formatted very specifically, you need both your departure weather, your en route weather and your arrival weather. And the weather feed somehow wasn't arriving at pilots electronic flight bags, so they couldn't dispatch. They had to resort to radio to get hold of the weather. Over 1400 flights were delayed as a result. And it's really interesting how you see sometimes really inconsequential things actually stopping planes going anywhere. Let's talk about more physical interactions, though. So we'll go into this when we talk about electronic flight bags in more detail. Uh, a problem that happens from time to time is when the pilots don't compute the uh, performance calculations when they depart at uh, an airport. So you be, might be surprised to know that uh, an, airport, an airplane very, very rarely uses full power. The, the performance called a D-rate calculation, or in the case of Airbus, a flex temp calculation, which tells the pilots how much power to use, given how much runway you've got, how heavy you are, whether there's wind in the right direction or behind you, whether there's rain or snow on the air, but lots and lots of different things that go into this calculation that tell you how much power you need. The benefit of that, of course, you use less power, less engine wear, and that's expensive, less carbon dioxide, less power produced. So that's environmentally friendly too. Um, this happens. Um, through miscalculations from time to time. Uh, every month or so, there is an incident that happens. Wonderful that we know about this, by the way. Why couldn't we have this in cyber where every step that might lead to a cascade, a chain of events that causes an incident gets reported on? Uh, one, there actually a couple, I think, in September 2019. One happened at Lisbon. The pilots calculated their performance calculation from the runway threshold, but then entered it 
through a change at one of the displaced um, intersections. So they ended up starting their takeoff roll over nearly 1400 meters from where they thought they were, but hadn't adjusted the engine performance calculations to apply more thrust. And now they realized, because they're well-trained pilots and applied full power as they realized they weren't gonna take off, and they took off successfully about 100 meters from the end of the runway. So a bit hairy. This happens from time to time anyway, but the idea of the flight bag is to reduce the chance of this uh, miscalculation. Now, something else I want to add when you're thinking about pen testing um, airplanes is you might be working on an airframe that's been retired, but you might also find components on there that are still in use by other operators. So you need real care when you're pen testing a plane. Be careful. It's also very easy, as I said, for the media to lose their shit over this. You don't hack the aircraft control systems from the in-flight entertainment system. But here's a great example of some research we're doing in the galley of a 747. You're going to find some old stuff too. Uh, and very much like those of you who have ever been out and done government IT health checks, you'll find some really, really old stuff. This is uh, a cabin management terminal. So it's a bit that runs the in-flight entertainment system. So it's where all the content comes to. It also maintains things like passenger lists and the, cr uh, the cabin crew can also do things like send messages to ground as well. Uh, it was Windows NT4 Surface Pack 4, I think. Uh, I don't know about you, this has taken me back a long, long time. It was, uh, the build was from 1996 and I don't know about you, but it's been so long since I've even looked at NT4. It was more of an exercise of trying to remember how to pen test it. And there was a lot of work. We actually ended up taking this away with us, worked offline, rebuilt it in the lab. And uh, it was quite good fun, but we successfully exploited it in the lab. Um, just kind of nice to go back down memory lane a bit, really. You also find some other weird stuff going on as well. So um, I've actually got one here. This is the nav database disk from a 747. You will find on board on older planes, you'll find floppies, which is, just makes me chuckle. Actually, uh, increasingly, the floppy disks on older planes are being repla uh, replaced by uh, data loaders. So instead of loading on a floppy, you'll use a, a portable um, data loader, a PDL. Um, you'll see those a lot, or you might see a portable maintenance term terminal, so a PMAT. Uh, you will find some really old stuff going on. Uh, on the right-hand side, that's a Penny and Giles quick access recorder. So that particular one sits in the cockpit and you need a PCMCIA card to, to download the data. Fortunately, they had a CF adapter in there. So we've actually got the data off there and it's quite interesting to see how the data is collated and aggregated. Down into the avionics bay, uh, that is a management unit for the engines and you'll see PC, PC cards being used there too. So it's really about turning back the clock, uh, but you also find interfaces that you will be familiar with. So this is from a, a uh, a CMT, and you'll find Ethernet, RJ45, fantastic. And you'll find stuff you can interface with and get useful data from. You'll also find uh, removable solid state disks. That's actually from a plane that's Golf Charlie India Victor Bravo. I need to get back to that plane to remove that SSD so we can rebuild the, um, the EIP and CMT in a lab and actually see what we can find it. Fascinating fun. Things start to get interesting when you start looking at passenger Wi-Fi. You'll often find the flight attendance panel or the cabin management terminal uh, present inside the cabin. And whilst they're typically in areas where the cabin crew will be working, it is within the bounds of practicality to actually get to one of these without being um, noticed too quickly. Although, in honesty, another passenger is probably going to see you doing this and I think you're going to find yourself rugby tackled pretty damn quickly. So it's a really interesting thought is that so much of in-flight security actually in the cabin relies on physical security. But actually, I think you know, with hijacks and terrorist events of the past, people have hypersensitive to this, but I still think that operators can do better. Um, yes, you could access the passenger Wi-Fi. What's the worst you could do by consequencing uh, tampering with the IFE, I suppose you could stop it working. One IFE vendor said to me they felt probably the worst thing you could do would be to actually put up content that suggested the plane was being attacked. Uh, that would cause a bit of a kerfuffle in the cabin, wouldn't it? But we could solve these by locking down the devices better. One fun thing we did find uh, as we found on one IFE we managed to pull the uh, S3 bucket credentials out of it. So there was an AWS environment on the ground when the plane landed. So when a micro switch detected weight on the wheels, it would spin up a, uh, a wireless access point. That interface with a protocol called GateLink, which allows exchange of data between the ground when you're on the ground. And that could then pull the daily news from uh, an AWS bucket. We found the credentials, discovered they were read writes. So once you're on the ground, you could actually uh, get the plane to pull the wrong 
data and potentially put some, I don't know, unpleasant content onto the IFE. And the first thing you, excuse me, know about it would be passengers going, why is there porn running on the IFE, for example? But anyway, that was quickly fixed, really responsive van manufacturer and vendor. They got it sorted fast. Other things you could do, uh, we also discovered once we could um, access the IFE, we could force it into a maintenance mode. Um, was it really that bad? It would annoy people, but would it? It's not really plain hacking, is it? Typically, when you're flying over um, land, the uh, in-flight Wi-Fi will pick up um, its internet connectivity by a beamforming downward facing LTE connection, much cheaper than doing satcoms. Uh, we did find this on a particular um, plane. Uh, it looked like it'd been deactivated, so we couldn't go too hard at it, but we did find rather amusingly the uh, password to the Wi-Fi router was written on a sticky label on the inside of the uh, cupboard door that was on there. And it really wouldn't have taken much to remember if the pass passengers simply find it. Um, that was fun. So to summarize IFE, you find a lot of really old stuff going on. There is new too, but there's a lot of old stuff going on there. A lot of exposed physical interfaces. Um, you could recover things. I think it's fair to say that old um, doesn't reflect the state of brand new in-flight entertainment systems. And I know that the manufacturers of these uh, systems take security very seriously nowadays. But a lot of this stuff is mitigated by physical security. You, know, you are going to get serious attention if you start tampering with the IFE. There are other areas that interface. So this is inside a 747. That's one of my colleagues, Dave Lodge, or Tautology Zero. He's up in the um, roof space and managed to access the satellite terminal, which brings the satellite data in. Now, again, you're working on ARIC 429, not RJ45 or Ethernet, so much harder to interface with, but we're hoping to borrow one of these terminals over the coming months so we can reverse engineer it and see how you can successfully get stuff from it. Now, I talked about EFBs a moment ago. I want to go listen to some real detail now. This is an area of research we've done over the last 18 months or so. So what does the EFB do? Well, it does all sorts. First of all, it tells you how, how much power to use, but it also tells you how to approach the airport. It might have things like your passenger information list. It'll have weight and balance calculations and all sorts of other stuff. There are two prime categories of electronic flight bag. First of all, there's the type that is hardwired into the plane that stays in the cockpit. And there's a different type called a portable, which is typically an iPad or another tablet and goes home with the pilot. Now, those that are bolted into the plane, much harder to access because they're high behind the cockpit door, but also much harder to keep up to date. And we found vulnerabilities of both types of VFB. Now, we'll talk about um, performance first. So this is what I discussed earlier, where we talked about the, the D rate or flex temp calculation. This is really interesting. Some, some EFBs will source it from the VSAT. They'll have an API where they pull data from. Some of it is going to be manually keyed in by the pilot, but they'll all have a local database about uh, the characteristics and lengths of all the runways and all the airports they visit around the world. What we discovered is the potential to tamper with some of the calculation logic and also the database entries. I'm not going to talk, tell you exactly how we've done that because uh, um, they're not fully fixed yet, but we found bugs that allow performance calculations to be tampered with, so they spit out the wrong data. This is an example of uh, us doing it on A320. That's actually our, our A3, A320 simulator with our own application written. And what comes out of the, the flex temp calculation is a temperature. You then enter that temperature into your flight management system, and that tells you how much power to use. It also tells you your V-speed. So if you're a pilot, you'll know well that your V-speed tells you V1 is when you can successfully stop the takeoff, chop the power, and successfully brake on the runway. No problems. V2 is the um, speed that if you lose an engine, you can successfully climb out and climb away safely. And the gap between V1 and V2 is where things get a bit hairy because you've got too much speed to stop, but not enough speed to take off. Great. Now, one of the challenges with is your performance calculation also sets your V speed. So there's the opportunity to tamp with these as well. So you could cause the pilot to rotate too early, causing a tail strike or too late and infringe your um, safety altitudes as you climb out. Uh, all sorts of problems. Uh, on approach, you can also uh, potentially tamp with auto braking action and cause the plane to go over the end of the runway. This has happened by pilots themselves getting it wrong. We found vulnerabilities. I'm not going to talk about these in particular in terms of installed EFBs, but um, there's all sorts of really interesting data on the electronic flight bag. Electronic flight bags that go to pilots with hotels, that go to restaurants and bars with them, that go home. Uh, we've even heard of reports of pilots letting their kids watch Netflix on their EFB on the way to the airport. 
I'm going to talk in generic terms about the disclosure um, experiences we've had. Uh, we've disclosed four vulnerabilities in different EFBs. Manufacturer X, bloody brilliant. Really, really cool. Totally awesome dealt with the vulnerability fantastically, gave us a remediation timeline immediately and have been updating us all the way. Uh, that's fantastic. A different manufacturer, complete opposite. They were defensive, suggesting the vulnerability was a product improvement. In the end, we had to uh, bring the regulator in and talk them in generic and anonymous terms about the vulnerability. And they sent us some regulation that so we then passed on to the manufacturer who kind of then said, all right then. Um, Another vendor of software on EFBs uh, has just completely stonewalled us. Um, we're in a bit of a difficult situation there. I think it's good back to the regulators. And another um, manufacturer was initially very combative, but then completely changed tack. It's been super amazing. And what's fascinating is I think it shows that the aviation sector is slowly waking up to interacting with security researchers. Some are causing all sorts of problems and still are way behind the curve. Others are way ahead of the curve and doing a really good job. Um, if anyone else is struggling to get uh, a vulnerability acknowledged by a manufacturer or operator, please let me know. I'll, I'll give you all sorts of help um, if I can, introductions and routes that get you listened to. Another great example of misunderstandings is misunderstandings between the manufacturers, between the operators and the regulators. There are some gaps in there that I think are interesting. One manufacturer was uh, of the opinion that because pilots both have an EFB, uh, that the EFB calculations for performance were done by each pilot independently. And then you'd have to hack, as a result of getting that to hack successfully, you'd have to hack two FBs at the same time. That's not the way that operators work. They have standard operating procedures to encourage crew cooperation. So typically what will happen is one pilot will enter all the data and the other pilot will check that data input to make sure it's sure. They'll pass the EFB between them. And it's also supported by the fact that um, even the manufacturer's minimum equipment list, so that's what you can fly with, only specifies one electronic flight bag. So some misunderstandings here that have crept in. And I think it's interesting to see that some manufacturers don't truly understand how their operators work and some regulators are slightly distracted about this as well. Um, a wonderful example of how to get things wrong. Now, we on the ground, we know how to lock down our tablets, right? You know, we'll use a mobile device management pro product and we'll have a really good lockdown on that. But sometimes this doesn't work in the air. And there's a great example of this with the use of, for example, Face ID on, on an iPad. You'd often encourage your workers to use Face ID or other biometric authentication to unlock their iPad for use on corporate systems. There's a problem with that though, because uh, if you do that on an iPad, Pilots will often wear reflective sunglasses. And if you don't have use it, uh, Face ID, it can be incredibly difficult to unlock a, uh, uh, an iPad using Face ID with reflective sunglasses on. Pilots look cool, right? But it's sunny out there, but even worse. So we're starting to see what are called quick reference handbooks. So if there's an emergency, uh, you'll have a, a flip chart, a flip card you go through to, if, for example, you depressurize, you need to do a crash descent, you lose an engine, you'll have a quick reference handbook that tells you what to check. You, most of the time it's done from memory, but you'll also go back through it as soon as you've um, contained the incident. These quick reference handbooks are increasingly going onto iPads, becoming an eQRH. Now, imagine you're dealing with a depressurization incident, you've got your face mask on, and now in order to use your eQRH, e you need to unlock the iPad. So I think we need to think really, really carefully about applying what we do on the ground in the air, All right? So we need to have very specific um, lockdown requirements when we apply security in the air. So I'd strongly um, encourage organizations to involve their pilots in the process. Yes, we shouldn't be watching Netflix and our EFBs, but we also need to think carefully about how we use them as well. Uh, regulations differ around the world. So the ERSA has got quite different regulations. The FAA and the CA are doing things differently as well. So there's, there's different types of regulation. Um, FAA have different oversight of a portable EFB compared to a, an installed one. And the ERSA have got different regulations too. Um, other stuff we've been doing, um, because I'm running out of time, we've spent time looking at ACARS, which is the, um, the messaging data link you'll find. Uh, TCAS, the collision avoidance system, we'll talk about in a sec. There's lots to be done on data loaders and maintenance access, to maintenance access terminals. Uh, ILS, there's been some great research done in spoofing um, instrument landing systems, but particularly radio altimeters, um, an area where 5G can actually cause problems. You can do stuff on instrument landing systems. There's some great um, research published there. Uh, for example, um, there's been some great research showing how you could potentially cause a misalignment. So you're lined up in cloud trying to come down the hill, um, uh, trying to come down the glide slope, I should say. And as soon as you break cloud, find out you're not 
actually align with the runway at all. Really interesting piece of work research has been done by others there. And also the collision avoidance systems. If two planes are flying towards each other, they've actually got a great bit of kit called TCAS or collision avoidance system that tells one plane to go up, the other plane to go down. Fantastic. Uh, the protocols that um, enable that are plain text. So if you could get yourself airborne with the right kit pointing direction antennas at other planes, you could in theory cause rogue collision alerts. Now, in the case of some planes, the autopilots will fly that resolution advisory, so the anti the avoidance bit themselves. There's been some great research done by a group called Avtech Oxford, who I strongly recommend you follow, showing what actually would often happen in this case of this crying wolf attack with these spoofed planes. Most pilots would then turn off the collision avoid avoidance system to therefore expose themselves to collision. Uh, so to wrap up, um, I think we all know as security pros is that you have to assume that devices aren't secure. And I think there's a degree of assumption in the aviation industry that needs to be questioned and increasingly is being so as well. We don't rely on what the manufacturers say to us because they often have quite different views of risk to us, particularly that example I showed you around EFBs. It's hard to keep legacy systems up to date because these things are flying around the world all the time. They're certified, they're hard to keep up to date. And there's a lot of technical debt out there too. You know, planes have lifespans of 10, 20 years in some cases. So there's a lot of old systems that only get refitted every six to seven years or so. So it's really hard to keep them up to date. But if you do find things or you do want to look at research, I'd recommend talking to the Aviation ISAC, really interesting group that used to be quite, I think they were quite resistant to independent research, but actually have embraced it more of late. And also the DEFCON Aerospace Village, which is really about building bridges between the research community and industry. And to give you an idea of the success we've had with the village. So uh, we went from two years ago with Boeing having had a bit of a run-in with IO Active around the 787 um, issues, to now Boeing actually coming to the Aviation Village and um, exhibiting there and talking and enabling independent research too. So it's a real success story. Strongly recommend you get involved. I absolutely love it. I co-organized it the first one two years ago and I've been helping out ever since. I absolutely love it. Anyway, loads more to read on our blog. In fact, we've just published another blog today about um, differences in regulation on electronic flight bags. Go have a read. There's loads to be done there. Uh, one of the things we're hoping to do, the corona's made it quite challenging, is have an open day on a 747 down at one of the boneyards so people can come along, learn, have a bit of a play and a poke and learn about aviation security. Thanks for listening.